Hi, and welcome to another episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Dimitri Lylan. And today I've got a special guest, Jeremy. Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself? Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm here in nice and cool Atlanta, actually. We had a front come through, so the temperatures dropped. Feels a little bit like Redmond weather when it's good weather, not the, <laughs> not, the regular Not the hellscape stuff. that we have right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> not the, the crazy stuff, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm a client developer advocate with Microsoft. I've, I've joined the team. I've worked with Microsoft in the capacity of an MVP and a consultant for about 10 years and just recently joined the team a, a couple of months ago. Pretty excited and stoked about that. Awesome. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, me and you ran into each other, I, I think, digitally before. I mean, I, I know your name's been around for quite a while. You've been part of the community. But there's this blog post that you did that triggered this episode. So why don't you kick off and tell people about uh, kind of your journey, uh, the product you built, and, and sort of what, why you wrote the blog post. I think that'll set the stage for why we're talking today. Sure, absolutely. So the, the story begins many years ago, in fact. The very first commit that I did to this particular tool was in 2010. And, you know, I, I like to think I, I haven't been a big coder or fan of, of writing a solution just to try to find a cool solution. Most of the things that I write are solving problems. Right. And the problem at the time was we had this great technology called Silverlight and people were using it everywhere, but there wasn't a really good local database solution for that. Yeah. And it wasn't a case where we were trying to build a, a full-fledged database. We know that we can use web service calls and connect to database front ends, but even for simple things like caching, storing local data, it just wasn't there. And when I went to look for solutions, most of the solutions required you to buy into the solution. And what do I mean by that? If I was creating an app for food, for example, and I'm, I'm using that because I have a, a great food example, I might build classes that are food-related classes. Well, to use these tools, you had to actually inherit from their base classes or implement certain interfaces and go through a lot of changes to make it work with Silverlight. So out of pure frustration, I built a tool that my rule was very simple. I shouldn't have to change the classes that I already had in my application, but this tool should allow me to be able to define what is the unique key on the class, store the class, serialize it, bring it back in, have some indexing capabilities, and basically give me a local database capability with, with really low friction, really low onboarding. Yeah, so it's I a paradigm a lot of us were familiar with right back then. You know, Silverlight apps needed that. I, I was a Silverlight developer back in the day, so I fully appreciate the need you were trying to solve and that kind of back and forth clean serialization without a lot of complexity is a must. I mean, it's still a must today in the most modern, you know, UWP app or whatever. So the problem is the same, but you, you had a very particular moment in time you tried to solve it, right? Yeah, I had a, a particular moment in time. And at the time, you know, we were following the MVVM, the model view view model pattern and mm -hmm. needed ways to store sessions. So we, we used it a bit in Silverlight, but the irony, and I didn't see this coming, was that right around the corner was the release of Windows Phone. <laughs> and when yeah. Windows Phone was released, it was released with Silverlight support. And so it was a very easy pathway to take Sterling, which is, is what I named the database, and I'll tell you why in a second. Sure. But I took Sterling and ported it to the phone, and it was one of the first database solutions available locally on the phone. So that really drove adoption, some early fitness trackers and some, some GPS systems, and a few pretty prominent apps picked up Sterling in the, the early days just because it was one of the first databases to, to get to market there. Yeah. But um, just a, a quick side story. The uh, the name was actually, I, I wasn't a, too super creative, obviously, at Silver Light, and this was Sterling, but I was always fascinated by the fact that there was this DLL in uh, Silver Light that was the core DLL. If you've done .NET programming, you know there's a core CLR and the, the base classes. Yep. And in Silver Light, it was called AG Core. And it is so obvious now that I know why, but when I first saw that, I was like, why would they call this egg core? What does this <laughs> egg core mean? And then right. I realized, oh, the, uh, the chemical abbreviation for silver, hmm. AG. I, I actually so didn't know was, that. That's, yeah, that's news so to me. Yeah, so it was the silver core. So I said, I want to do something sneaky like that for my database. Eh, let's call it Sterling. Cool. 
So you created this product, right? This database technology, and and like what .NET framework were you targeting at the time? I mean, this was Silverlight, right? I I already my, my mind's already fuzzy, like what was Silverlight's .NET version, <laughs> or how that even worked. Right. So when I, I first built it, it was definitely Silverlight four, but around right. that time. I think, uh, and this is actually important because it brings us to the present time too, there was a new type of library that was just becoming popular called Portable Class Library. Yeah. So once we got to the phone, we realized we have a code base for Silverlight. Now we have a code base for the phone. You know, right around the corner was the whole Windows 8 launch and, and some of that technology. And so there, there needed to be this solution. So the Portable Class Library came out and what was nice library is it covered enough API surface area that I was able to quickly take Sterling and build it as a portable class library. So the way it was architected was all the core pieces that did the serialization and indexing and understood how to manipulate the database. That was all portable code back in the day, yeah. which is interesting. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But then the very specific items, for example, in Silverlight in the browser, we had isolated storage in the phone we had a, a special phone type of storage right. device specific so considerations write. you always had to consider right pcl gave you that that's your generic code but there was always that extra thing you had to do right exactly P pcl was and a lot of people don't realize this but pcl was sort of a kludge right it was an illusion it it created these uh type forwarding classes but at the end of the day there were there were two challenges with pcl that i think uh you know net standard addresses today, but the, the first challenge was that you had a lowest common denominator, right? So yeah. when you wanted to target platform X, Y, and Z, it was minimum set of APIs that can be accommodated on these platforms. The second problem though is as more platforms came out, that matrix became so complex. It was like if I check these three, what is the magic combination of APIs that are support and became tough. So I, I kind of call that the framework down approach. It was like, here's the frameworks, let's mm -hmm. take it down yeah. to what's common. Whereas .NET standard is the standard out approach. It's let's implement a standard that has a core set of APIs and then build these other projects to adhere to that standard, which in my opinion is a much better approach. Yeah, I mean, PCL at the time solved the real problem, right? We needed to share code across all of these places where .NET was running at the time. The, the Silverlight, the WPFs of the world, the Windows Phone, the Windows 8, I was a developer on all of those platforms. So PCL and me spent a lot of time, like you said, checkboxing just enough to, to get it to work and then building the, the specific libraries wherever, wherever they were needed for something really device specific or platform specific. And, and you're right, it was the, that, I, I like the way you described it, I never thought about it that way, but it is the approach of, of really building to the lowest common denominator. I think, um, I think today's world is very, is very different and it's, it's cool that we, we sort of got your project all the way to here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about like what, what was your blog post all about? Because it kind of takes that you know, your, your database project, your PCL work, all of that, and brings it to the modern era. So how did you, you get to today's point and what did you do? So it was it's interesting. It's a, a small world. At the time, uh, I was not working for Microsoft, but Tim Heuer was very involved with Silverlight. And in 2011, I think it was, he tweeted a post and said, when is Jeremy going to port Sterling? So I said, well, that sounds like a, a good challenge. Let me go see. So I cracked open .NET Core at the time, the, the 1.0 version, mm -hmm. and uh, let's go ahead and, and serialize something. Oh, wait, there's no binary writer. Okay, let's uh, l reflect on the class, because remember, the whole rule for Sterling was that I wouldn't have to modify my classes, so I need reflection to look at them. Oh, wait, the full API surface area isn't there. So it was really a, a stopgap for me, and what's interesting is .NET Core, the first release, addressed a lot of scenarios. And we used it actually quite a bit at my last consulting company for Greenfield projects. If we were building something fresh, we had the tooling there. But where I think a lot of frustration came from was from authors of tools and frameworks and libraries and even enterprises that had existing code who wanted to migrate their code well, they kept slapping into that that barrier, right? Of the API doesn't exist. There's yep. there's just not enough overlap. 
Yeah, that's and always so the I, number one fear I think we have as developers, right? It's, it's even less about existing projects because often you, you don't touch those nearly as much as you'd like to. It's more about the community of projects that you know you depend on for the next project and can they get there with their libraries because we all depend on open source so much compared to the Silverlight days, let's face it. It's even, even back then we were starting to more and more with projects like yours and today I, I can't imagine any real world project on Windows or .NET Framework in general without support from, from various frameworks. So it, it sounds like you were, you were part of that problem space. Yeah, it was definitely part of the problem space. And what is interesting at the time is is the iteration that Sterling grew to. So it, it built support for the Windows runtime. Several, because it was open source, and, and this was before, I, you know, open source has been out for a long time, but in the .NET community, it wasn't as popular at the time, but it was open source on Coplex. So we had a lot of interested individuals on different projects contributing and solving problems and it was really neat for me as a developer to see that concept of you know someone doesn't just have to come in and, and say hey there's an issue but they would literally post here's an issue here's a yeah. patch you know you can fix that so it was frustrating not to be able to, to bring it into this .NET core but you know quite frankly at the time it was brand new too and I'm not sure where the demand was so I sort of set it out there said, you know what, for a lot of the, the mobile applications now, there's other solutions, there's ports of SQLite, there's a lot of other tools that are available, so I'm not going to invest much time in it, which brings us to, to now because the announcement of the release of .NET Core was coming up, and I was very curious about what the story is, what, what the change is, and so I started looking into .NET Core 2.0. And of course, to do that, you really have to understand the separation between .NET Core, which is the implementation, and right. .NET Standard, which is the interface and describes what that implementation needs to adhere yeah. to, right? So yeah. it becomes a minimal requirement. So .NET Core adhering to .NET Standard 2 says minimally it's going to support all of the APIs in 2. So I said, great, let's see what APIs are in, in 2. And I started digging in, and I don't have the exact figure but I think it's something like 13,000 APIs that were in 1.6, the previous .NET standard, mm -hmm. yeah. jumped to 32,000. Yeah, it's, it's quite .NET exponential of a, of a change, right? It's it's a lot more APIs. <laughs> They're bringing .NET really to, to the point where it's quite productive even for existing projects, right? And that's, I think, where you, you tried to look at it again. Yeah, I, I looked at it again and, and said, okay, you know, we've got XML serialization, we've got the binary readers and, and writers, uh, reflection had thousands of new methods ported over. So it really got me to the point that I said, I wonder how hard it will be to migrate Sterling. Because I, I keep hearing, you know, one of the challenges and stop gaps, .NET Core great for new projects. What about migrating existing? I said, I've got this perfect progress or project that I put on the shelf that uses reflection, uses serialization, uses a lot of advanced APIs in surface area. Let's see what it takes. Yeah. So I pulled down the project, literally built a new uh, class library targeting .NET Standard 2, and just dropped all the files into that project. So I used the .NET console, .NET new class, and classlib, which does the .NET Standard, dropped them in, went to compile, the only compiler issue that I got was the uh, resources I was using. So I was using a ResX file, and it was an old way of doing right. localization, and that resource didn't compile to it. So I really quickly hacked it by making a static class and just sur surfacing hard-coded because this was for exceptions that were being thrown. So I quickly went through the list and just copied them from the resource file into the class, hit compiled and it worked. I said, well, this can't be right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was that's expecting right. more, more work than that. Something so is not going to work. Test app. Yeah, let, let's uh, write a little test app, wiring wire in some objects and query them out and, and lo and behold, it, it worked. And so I, I was stunned. And in my mind, you know, I've been in consulting for a lot of years and I've talked to a lot of people just in the past few years about .NET Core. And I think a, a lot of people were concerned about that API surface area. So in my mind, it wasn't really about Sterling that I wrote the post. It was about mm -hmm. all the new capabilities for 2.0. And Sterling was a way to show how that's changed. That story changed from literally 2011, didn't even want to touch it, 
to here we are 2017 with just one small tweak i'm able to to get compiled and ported and i say how many other libraries are like that well there is a blog post that came out with the announcement for .NET Core 2.0, and by that team's estimate, they said in looking at NuGet and scanning the API surface area in NuGet, 70% of the projects should be API compatible wow. with .NET standard. And so that's a, a lot of people that, if they're not aware of this new capability, are, are missing out on having their library available in a lot of different places, right? Because we've got Xamarin, support for .NET standard. We have Mono, we've got the .NET Core, we've got the .NET Framework. And in preview, I believe, uh, coming out, I don't know when, is the Universal Windows Platform yeah. support. They actually think shipped that standard. already. So I think that just came out very recently. Um, but yeah, it's basically you know up to each ecosystem to get up to .NET standard 2.0 compatibility, right, with that specification. So it, it, it is a bit more work, but I really feel for the community of projects out there in code, it's, it really is the right, right way to do it. We can't always head down towards the, towards the minimum. We have to head towards something that people can actually build real solution towards. And I think it'd be cool to show people your, your converted project. Is that something you can demo for us a little bit? Absolutely. Awesome. I, I have a screen here that I'm going to share for you. And what I did, is this project is out on GitHub. Let me just pull this up. Yep. And I'm going to show the, the GitHub first. So it's it's Sterling Net Core. Mm -hmm. And originally, I had just done a very simple test that I'll show you. But I wanted to write a Meteor test to, to demo today. So I'm going to walk through what that looks like in a second. Let me pull up my Visual Studio code. So basically, in, in this project, you can see Sterling Core. So these are the bits of Sterling. We could spend hours going through the, the, the pieces. And, and I think it's a lot easier to demonstrate with how do I hook up into Sterling. Yeah. So I'm just project including it. I haven't packaged it as a NuGet package or anything, but I'm just doing a local reference. But my test was literally I created a cat class that has a string key and a string name. I created a cool color class. That has a GUID ID and a string name. And then I created a planet class that has an integer ID and a string name. Sterling actually supported triggers, so I went ahead and created a GUID trigger so that if I don't initialize that ID, it can initialize it for me cool. and generate a new, new GUID for that. Yeah. And then I've got this database definition. So the database definition does inherit from an instance, but you notice these classes have no attributes, no... Yeah. you know, inheritance or anything. Yeah, they're it's very clean. Pure. They're pure. So there's this fluent interface that defines what is the key. So for cat, the key's a string, so it's C key. For cool color, it's a GUID. For planet, it's an integer. And then we've got this combo, and the combo class aggregates, has an ID, and then it has a cool color, planet, and a cat. Awesome. So one of the things that is unique about Sterling is it behaves sort of like an object document database, but it maintains referential integrity. So it's smart enough, if I save one of these combo objects, instead of serializing the full color, it's just going to serialize the key and go look at the color serialization to deserialize that. So that was one of the features to reduce the footprint of the size, because remember, this was phone days when yeah. we, before size we could just go out and buy 256 gigabyte, you know, small cards that we could could slip in there. So the database does this. We've got an initialization. I've just created colors, red, orange, yellow, blue, blah, 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 panther, cougar, links. These are just initializers. It's creating the objects, building up its own key for some of them. And this is literally it. It's just DB safe. And that serializes it. Sterling has everything it needs to know to do that. And then in our main program, what this is doing is it's registering the database. And what I did with Sterling is I separated the driver that persists everything from the database logic itself. So that meant I could have an in-memory driver to have an in-memory database. I could write an isolated storage driver. I even had someone who wrote an Azure table storage driver. Oh, that's driver. Cool. So, so there's a, it's extensible in that way. So what this does is it populates the database, and then it does a query. And it does the queries a, a couple ways. I'm, I'm, just going to run this really quickly. Let me pull this up and get into the right folder. So this is my little git bash shell. 
So if I go into Sterling console test, we're just going to do a .NET build. I'll do a release build and let that spin out and target. And what you'll see is it's going to pull in the uh, Sterling core base and build that. So that's the Sterling core. And then it's going to build the test app. And then it's going to complete. And then if I do a .NET, and I actually I'm just giving it the, the path to the application right now, Sterling console test. I could type correctly. <laughs> I only do this for a living. Yeah. So it's saving colors. I just put a thread sleeve. That's why I took that. It's got 441 combinations. It picks a random color. And then it's actually iterating through that combo box based on, on the colors. And that's what you're seeing come out. And then it just tells you the time to complete, which is really slow here. I think because I'm sharing on Skype, it runs a lot more quickly when when I don't have the, the screen share running. Yeah, and so of course the most amazing thing about what you're showing is, is that foundationally, once you got it to .NET standard 2.0, this now can run on Windows, can run on Linux, can run in UWP when that environment supports it. Anywhere where .NET standard is supported, you now have this cross-platform database engine from a project that you built in Silverlight days, just, just to give our audience a context on the time here. And, and that, that's a great context. In fact, the, the end of my blog post is is literally pointing out that in 2011 I wrote this little app and today 2017 for the first time I'm able to run it on a Linux machine without yeah. modification without doing anything special and that that to me is is huge so I'm going to start this running now this is a little bit more advanced example so while it's running I'm going to go through the code what this does is goes out to the publicly available USDA nutrition database so those files are hosted on a site. I've got parsers in this import that read the text files in, parse them into actual full models. So that's what you're seeing here is like a food group. Mm -hmm. It is a pretty straightforward class. If uh, I can get it to pull up here, actually, let me yeah, expand. So food group is just a code and description. But then we've got a nutrient. So a nutrient has two parts to it. It maps to a food ID, so think of protein, carbohydrate, fat content, and then it maps to a definition because there's a very standardized definition for these. So these are nested objects. Now I'm just going to go and go to the food item. It has an ID. It belongs to a group. We can nest that group inside of it. It's got description, short description, list of weights. So that's if it's a cup dry, a cup you know, cooked, whatever, and nutrients. So what, what is happening down here? is we're actually reading those files in, parsing them into these classes, and then storing them in the Sterling database so I can run a query in a second. And just to show you, again, we're just looking at straight C-sharp classes. And if I look at my USDA database, what I'm defining is I'm telling it food group has a string key, nutrient definition has a nutrient key. Sterling also supports the concept of indexes. And this is why I tell people, you know, Sterling's not intended to be a, a SQL Server or Cosmos DB replacement. It's meant to be a local lightweight cache. In fact, the most popular use case for Sterling was what's called tombstoning in the phone days. And that was right. when you had new models for your application state and wanted an easy way to save it off when someone flipped applications. So, so that's the idea here. But what Sterling does with indexes is because everything's serialized and deserialized, with an index, it'll keep that index in memory, which if you think about complex large objects and you have thousands of those, that's a huge memory footprint. If I'm just storing, for example, IDs and simple strings, then I can store a pretty good amount of those. So in this index, what I'm telling it to do, and I can even create my own keys on the fly. That's what's beautiful about it, because Sterling just calls my Lambda expression to evaluate the key. So I'm telling it, store as an aggregate key the food ID and the nutrient ID, but create an index on the amount in 100 grams. So it'll say there's this much protein in 100 grams, or there's this much water in 100 grams. And so what it's doing is in that index, it's keeping that in memory. So even though it doesn't have the full food items in memory, it has the index in memory. So you can very quickly get to the entity that you want, and then you can lazy load the full entity. 
for That's that. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, those are real world scenarios. Uh, you know, in any sort of application, and I've had to tackle this multiple times, you, you will sometimes have to load a lot of data and you want people to kind of, as they type, to look up various values and, and you just need a little bit of help with that. That doesn't come for free, especially when you get to hundreds of thousands of objects sometimes of, with data in them. Um, so it's kind of cool that you're able to take you know, all those investments you, you made, I mean, this is code you wrote again, like six, seven years ago, right? Um, it's, it's old code, it, but it, it's code that's well written for, for what it needed to do, and you just freaking converted it to that .NET standard. I'm, I'm very impressed, and this thing is still going at us, but it looks like it's pulling down a lot of data. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot slower. I should have kicked it off sooner. Again, I think the, the Skype is slowing my system down, but we can loop back to it. But I wanted to show this part. This is yep. my import strategy. So this literally takes a, a list of items, and you can see I'm using generics, and um, imports it by bulk saving it. Mm -hmm. Now this is a little wonky. This is something I need to refactor, because before we had our awesome thread library with tasks, we used background workers. Oh my right? gosh, me and background worker go way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I know there's uh, some conversion between the two, but I just used what was there. So this is using a background worker to save the, the list. But what I love about being able to use generics, right, as, as C Sharp as a language, is I can have a strategy where even though I don't know ahead of time the type that I'm trying to save to my database, it's all based on generics. So I can pass in food item, food group, and the same save routine works. And it's just reporting percentage done. You can see we're getting close to the end here. But what blows my mind is that this code using generics, reflection, and everything else is the same code now that's going to run on a Mac. And, and this example, everything I'm showing here, this entire screen, this is Visual Studio Code. So Visual Studio Code will run on Mac, it'll run on Linux, and it's .NET Core, which will run on all those target areas. So all of this experience is, is the same no matter where you go. So yeah. what I've done is I've, I've loaded the collection. So now I'm doing a query. I just want to run this real quick and then show you the code and then we'll pop back. So this query is, is listing in the cereal category, foods by protein content. So vital wheat, gluten comes out on top and then pasta, whole wheat is down here. It's just doing the top 20. And then we do it again for carbohydrate content. And then we do it again for fat content. So we can see, okay, what foods are high in protein or high in fat? The way that looks, if we come back over to the program, and I expand my terminal back, is using a link query. So I'm literally coming here, querying my nutrient key, and joining it to the full food item using my split key. Remember, I aggregated the key. So I can actually, as part of my link mm -hmm. query, say split that and just compare one side of it. So this time I'm just looking for protein. Order descending, select the tuple, and then I lazy load the food value. That's why you saw a little pause. So even though it figured out the whole list of items, only as I asked for them did it deserialize that full food item from the, the deserialization. And this at the time, and again, you know, I, I stress there's a lot of different, very optimized solutions now, but at the time for very simple, inobtrusive way to basically, you know, store some of your view models or some of your cache data and then be able to, to query it. This was uh, what the, the magic of Sterling was about at the time. Yeah, that's awesome. I think this sends a really clear message. That, you know, if, if I was a library developer out there, um, you know, it's easy to, to hear some, some team at Microsoft give some percentage, right? And say, oh, this percentage, that percentage of, you know, developers can now look at their libraries and convert to this thing. But you're, you're one of those people, you're, you had a real project. This wasn't conceived to demonstrate this was a good example that just happened to be there. And to me, that's what made your blog post so authentic, and I love authentic stuff. And uh, there you go, you showed it running, so definitely no smoke and mirrors. This was real code, you've converted, <laughs> it's up on GitHub. People should definitely take a look. Um, if, you're, if you're starting a project today, you know, from the other side of the fence, and you're a, a developer that, that's looking at .NET Core, um, you know, what message would you give them with, you know, .NET Core 2 and .NET Standard 2.0 in general? Like, I think this release is, is, from my perspective, very solid, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how far .NET has come as a, as a general framework. Uh, I think it's come a, a long ways, and there's, there's certainly very specific scenarios that need very specific parts of the library and, and the full framework, if you will, that uh, make sense for that. 
But in general, especially if you're starting to embrace this concept, and I hate to use overloaded terms. I know everyone's saying microservices today, right? Sure. But if you think about it, let's not focus so much on the name and just the concept. And that concept's been around a while. Let's focus on one thing, do that one thing well, test that one thing, package that one thing, share that one thing, right? It's a component as part of an application. If you're looking at components, I believe developers will find 80, 90, maybe close to 100% of their surface area can be handled by something like .NET Core. And what's nice about it is with the current versions, you can mix and match, right? So the yeah. .NET framework can reference .NET standard. So I don't believe developers are losing anything if they take a core first approach. Mm -hmm. And then if they need to build the bits in the full framework that they but if they're writing small services, APIs, endpoints, there's a lot of advantage to doing core. First, the lessons learned from how many years, right, of the full .NET framework, this was an opportunity, even though the API surface area is the same, for that team to build it from the ground up. And there's been plenty of blog posts about benchmarking and performance that's pretty impressive what those capabilities are. So we've, we've got that coupled with the fact that for free, as a developer, you now can create a library or a code base that will run on so many different platforms. And you never know when that little utility or library you write may become useful, may take off, someone else might need it. You may not think that your app is gonna end up on a, a tablet or a phone, right? Yeah. But if it does someday, this sort of buys it to you for free. And the last thing I'll say that I think is important too, is it's tough to be a developer today and not talk about the cloud. That's what I, I do day in and day out is the cloud. But when I look at software today, I don't worry as much about how cool the technology is or the language. I'm worried about what does it take to get it from the concept to the end deployment, right? Because that's cost of business. How fast can you get it to market? How much of that pipeline are you focused on innovating and doing what's important versus doing all this side stuff that has to be done on every project, you know, standing up a virtual machine, configuring it. And what's nice is um, today when we're recording this, general availability of web app on Linux and container web app was announced. It, it That announcement just came out. Yeah, just and that's the a, books. What's that? Yeah, it just came out like today, literally, like as we as we were preparing to record this episode. Right. And I, I think, you know, programming aside and what does it take, you know, does it support generics, whatever, what is that that pipeline for continuous integration and deployment? And there's some very mature pipelines that can package .NET Core apps into a container. There's tooling that's built in. Developers, I'm showing Visual Studio Code. Developers don't have to leave the full Visual Studio to get this experience. But what's nice is with tools like this, I can take something like container web apps I can containerize my .NET application, take .NET Core, right click, add Docker file, create image, post it out, and deploy that to an infrastructure that will automatically scale instances, gives me a dial, I want five, I want 10, or based on CPU or based on request, have all this auto scaling capability without the overhead of me having to understand all the nuances of the infrastructure behind that. And I think that's huge as, is that coupling with this technology and what we have available in the cloud for rapidly provisioning nodes and infrastructure to run the .NET Core apps, and and that's what gets me excited about it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really it's really come a long way. I think um, if I had any hesitation to tell somebody to go try .NET Core before, I think 2.0 and standard 2.0 really has taken those away and, and I speak that in an authentic way like you. I come from a consulting background. I, I know how important it is for people to actually solve real problems and be productive and meet budgets and all of that. I mean, that's, that's the real world people live in and we get to play with all this cool tech on the other side of it. So when we give a suggestion, we're, we're asking people to spend their time and their money. And I, I think for once we, we can do this with .NET Core 2.0 and be really confident. They've got a great web story, UWP story, they've got componentization. They can go to the cloud with it. They can run it on Linux, they can run it on Windows. The sky's the limit, <laughs> to take some puns aside there. But uh, yeah, it's awesome. And we, it's really awesome that you came on to show this to us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, uh, I had no clue. Just like when I wrote Sterling, it was to solve a specific problem. I had no clue it would solve it and become 
popular the way it was back in the day. But this blog post that I wrote, I wrote because I was excited. I saw what was possible. I said, I want to write about this and, and share it. Plus, and you know, this is kind of a guilty pleasure, but to find a tweet that's six years old and finally be able to reply to it. Yeah, and that's, that's what awesome. I did. At the end of the day, I, I replied when he said, when are you going to port? I said, how about now? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and linked to the, So that was a lot of, of selfish fun, but it, it yeah. went viral and a, a lot of people picked it up. And I think it is because there is a desire to tap into the features and functionality. And there was a little bit of reluctance based on the history and the track record, not of issues, but just lack of API surface area. So yeah. I, I really do feel with .NET Standard 2 and .NET Core 2.0 that it's a major game changer and that people should take it seriously, take a look at it. And you know what? I'm going to put myself on the hook and on, on the line for this, but go take a look at it, try it out. And if you have issues or problems with it, reach out to me. I'm, I'm very reachable. My blog has contact information. My GitHub does. And because I'm I'm interested in removing friction and helping make this happen, I can't do it myself, obviously, but I'll bang on very transformative. And I would love to see that 70% of NuGet packages that can support .NET standard to support .NET yeah, standard. I think awesome. that'd be really awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Jeremy, so much for coming on the show. And uh, we'll put the links to your GitHub repo, the blog post, and your Twitter handle so folks can actually reach out to you and bug you and ask some questions. I'm sure people will have them. And, uh, you know, we'll hope to have you on again when you have some awesome, more awesome stuff to show us. Sounds cool. Well, I will do my best to work on awesome. Thanks again for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you it. for being here. And uh, thank you for watching Visual Studio Toolbox. Uh, hope you come back again. Take care, folks.